Um, my pleasure to introduce uh, Hoki, um, who I could say many things about, uh, CNBC anchor, lots of things that he's done over his career. But the one thing I really want to say, something I learned last night, was that he did help tear down the goalposts at Lane Stadium one time. So <laughs> with that, Brian Sullivan. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Yes, that was a long time ago. Don't judge me. I was young and dumb. But it was a lot of fun, I have to say. And apparently, because of, we were able to tear them down, they, Virginia Tech invented or helped invent the retractable goalposts, thus saving millions of lives. And <laughs> <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, it's really, this is a great uh, conference. And it's so nice to see actual people, Brandy, because uh, one thing I always say to my team, in the digital age, relationships, human relationships, matter more now in the digital age than they did in the past. Because it's too easy to default to just digital relationships. I always tell any new member of my team at CNBC, one phone call is worth 50 emails and one handshake is worth 50 phone calls. Get on a plane, get in a car, do what you guys are doing here, have breakfast, have coffee, get to know the actual human beings behind whatever you're doing, especially in technology. And I'm also proud to say that um, this is pretty cool. I'm by no means an expert, and I'll introduce Brendan in a second, in what Brendan's gonna talk about, but I am proud to be a part of, my freshman class here was the first, as I understand it, the first university freshman class anywhere in America to require every incoming freshman to own a computer. So everyone had to buy a computer before they were owned only by like the six richest kids on campus. So we got a choice between an IBM pizza box and an early Mac, and they had T1 lines in our dorm room. So I felt like Virginia Tech is, has sort of, for lack of a better term, helped develop the architecture uh, to build out and do great things in computer science, obviously with Block One, Dan Larimer, here in Blacksburg. And now our featured guest, Brendan Bloomer, who I learned is from Iowa, he spends most of his time in Hong Kong and the other 50% of the time on an airplane. And which is what you have to do when you are a 33-year-old entrepreneur and CEO of not only, I think it's fair to say, Brendan, a, a growing company, growing also your architecture, but gro a growing industry. And I'm old enough to remember when Linux was sort of new-ish and we all tried to figure out what it was and you know, there were people that knew it and it was hard to explain. I feel like sometimes the blockchain world is that way. It can be a little smarter than you Right, but there are practical applications for it. Tell us a little bit about Block One, what you guys are trying to do, and more importantly, where you see the industry headed. That's great, thank you. Um, uh, so Block One, uh, as, as everybody or some people may know here, has been around for a couple years now. Uh, we're really focused on taking blockchain and expanding the use cases on what it, uh, what it can do. Uh, everyone probably knows that the first implementation of blockchain was Bitcoin. Um, and while Bitcoin was architected exactly for its use case as a store of value, as a settlement layer store of value, uh, if you want to expand beyond that to, 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 to transactions that aren't as of high value as big monetary you know, sums, um, you need to rectify a few of the issues that uh, are inherent with blockchain technology. Um, and those really came down to three things. We needed to make it more scalable, we needed to make it faster, and we needed to make it cheaper. Um, and that's what led me to uh, my CTO, my business partner, Dan Larimer. Uh, he had been the inventor of a protocol called Delegated Proof of Stake. It was what? really focused. <laughs> it's an alternative to proof of work, okay. um, but basically it's just how the blockchain reaches consensus and puts things on the blockchain. On the ledger. On the ledger, yes. And so ultimately uh, I was attracted to some of the work that he was doing there, and we actually met for the first time uh, here in these conference rooms in, uh, in Blacksburg, Virginia. And this is actually where we were talking a little bit earlier where uh, EOS IO was actually conceived and designed uh, for several months while we were meeting back and forth. But really trying to focus on those three things, and what that does is it allows blockchain transactions to start to apply to things beyond high value financial transactions. So if we wanna move to a world where we put every timestamp and every entry into databases on a blockchain based ledger, we really needed to tackle those. And while we've made huge headway there, we've gotten block times down to one second, We've gotten transaction costs down to, to minimal, and a single, th you know, a single blockchain now can reach single-threaded throughput of up to 10,000 transactions a second or so, continually improving. There's more work to be done. 
The next step is to really get into uh, multiple sets of blockchains and, and schedulers that can push things across many different blockchains. When you say 10,000 a second, what are, what are we analyzing? What's the, for those, I, and, and I know there's a lot of people in this room who know exactly what he's talking about, and there's some that may be on the edge of it. Everybody's intelligent. I, I don't want to go down too many weeds, but what would be the more practical uses for what you're talking about from a business perspective as you grow block one? Yeah, when I say transactions per second, I'm really just looking at actions, right? So with your, when you're trying to put something on the blockchain or change something on the ledger, it's an action, an entry into the database. And so it, historically, blockchains have been limited at how many actions it, it can, can process at a given moment. And so we're continuing to, we call that single-threaded throughput, right? And we're continuing to increase those, but at the same time, we're also looking at how we scale on a, on a near infinite level horizontally by scheduling things across multiple blockchains and allowing for real horizontal scalability that enterprises require to truly adopt blockchain as part of their technology stack. You know, you watch commercials now, and from a business journalist perspective, it reminds me of, you know, sort of whenever there's a hot new technology, and I understand blockchain is actually not that new, but Every company's trying to latch onto it, right? You know, any technology, we're blockchain, and, you know, because they want to say, they want to be in, you know, involved in this, in this nation uh, world and sort of this, this upbringing, if you will. Do most big companies get it? I think uh, a growing number of big companies do. I think one of the initial uh, approaches that, um, or interpretations large organizations had of blockchain, well, we can do that faster and cheaper, right? And they failed to recognize the social movement that blockchain was creating. And what I believe is really happening here is because we were able to create an ultra-secure and ultra-transparent and therefore auditable ledger, right, it's starting to transform what consumers expect in terms of best practices for business models. Right? So we live in a world where right now we can see what Facebook shows us. We can see our news feed. We know there's algorithms back there. We know they're taking our data and they're using it to service ads. We have a general premise of what's going on, right? But we can't see anything below the surface. All the databases and all the logic that impacts everything that we see and do is hidden from us. Well, they don't want you to see it. Of course, of course. <laughs> But I believe that over time, blockchain is going to change that. And they're going to change that through a consumer-led demand that people show us what's below the surface. We now want to see what they're doing with our data, how they're serving us ads, who's paying for it. That's a big wall you're trying to knock down. Yes, and just as the internet came in and, 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 and started to disrupt the establishment that existed back then, you'll have few people that will adapt, but you'll have more people that will emerge right, and start to throw out better solutions that over time garner more trust with their consumers and give more functionality to their consumers and ultimately lead to that transformation. But you're, deep, you're dealing with deeply embedded corporations with long hierarchies, hundreds, tens or hundreds of thousands of employees Absolutely. trying to change their thinking I, I, or, or at least adjust their thinking or bring in a new way to think. What are you trying to do? Well. If you look at back at the, uh, uh, you know, the Harvard Business Review wrote a really great article that said blockchain is not a disruptive technology, it's a foundational technology, meaning that it's not going to come in and transform everything in two to three years. It's fundamentally a new building block that we can use to create alternative systems. I always say that we've been building with straw and hay, and now we have concrete. And if you want to build skyscrapers, right, the first one's going to be leaky, it's going to be a little bit ugly, but eventually, you, if you want to build big things, you need to use cement, right? So uh, I believe that this is going to take time. I don't believe this is something that's going to happen immediately. And, I, and ultimately, I think it's going to come down to the organization on an independent basis, their willingness to embrace these new technologies and change and risk. The reality is when you get into all these big businesses, they have different risk profiles. Some don't even have mandate to take big risk. And those are going to be the ones that are going to come in later, and they're going to be dealing with change after the fact and collecting whatever market share they have left. But I do think that the majority of the innovation is going to come from emergent companies the same way that the internet transformed our economic landscape. Most of the big tech companies, just list them out in the FANG, the, the largest tech companies in the world, they didn't exist before, right? It wasn't print and publishers that emerged into social media, right? It was new people that were embracing the technology and had high appetite for risk to take real change because they had nothing to lose. 
So I think you're going to see a lot of the same things, but I do think that you'll see a lot of innovative organizations, more private organizations, embrace the technology and adapt their technology stacks, change the trust and the relationship they have with their consumers, and realize the value proposition of, of, of the technology. What they're going to do is sit on the sidelines, wait it out, and then come by you. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> Is that the long term? If, if we're willing to sell. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, would that be the longer term plan? We're a very values driven organization. So I think that everything would have to be assessed based off of what the plan was and whether we saw opportunistic synergy in order to reach you know, our mission. I guess what I struggle with, Brendan, is that you know, just from my perch, looking at companies, talking about companies, I hear the words decentralized. You hear that with blockchain all the time. And yet I hear security. And for me, and I think probably for a lot of larger corporations, or even mid-sized corporations, they would have tr trouble sort of joining. When I hear decentralized, I don't think it's more secure. I think it's more Wild West. Yeah, that's a great uh, uh, analogy. I, you know, decentralized is a very, I have a weird relationship with that word, because I understand what a lot of people are mean, but we all define it very differently. And one of the things you see is, in, you know, even with our, our, our own community, everyone's, you know, some people say Bitcoin's centralized by miners that control the hash power. People say EOS or Ethereum. Everyone's centralized from a different attack vector. Um, the, the decentralized movement can be applied to all different sorts of things. You can look at decentralization on a geography basis. Mm -hmm. You can look at it on a beneficial interest basis. And you can look at it on a control basis. And so everyone has this different uh, definition of it. And I think, and I try to move away from that term as a whole and really start talking about different forms of specific governance, right? Because anything that changes has to have a control group that makes those changes. And I think there is a growing movement to try and disperse that control out through society so that there's more checks and balances, but there's no one size fits all. There is no definition of decentralization. What we're trying to do is create networks or systems or organizations that better represent all of us through better, more sophisticated, and more balanced forms of governance. But you've got all these different people and organizations, entities around the world, each with a community. You hear that term a lot around Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum, everything. But yet they may have different goals. And so it's, it's hard to sort of tie. Some point you get, you get to a point where there's going to be some natural conflict in the building of an industry, which is what you guys are part of. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And when we get into you know, block one and the role we play in that whole, specifically on a governance side, we spend our days building the underlying technology EOSIO. This is technology that has been applied through many different blockchains. And to be quite honest, a lot of our competitors have used different forms of Dan's you know, delegated proof of stake innovations. So if you look at the top 10 or top 20 public blockchains, there's a lot, a lot of them that came from the technology that, we, that, that Dan or, or EOS had evolved on. And so what we really do is we focus on that underlying technology. We've played a very backseat role in governance, um, as a ch you know, and that has been a choice that we've made because we don't want to get behind and endorse one specific form. Um, and there's tons of blockchains, public and private, that use our technology. And we don't say or even allude to presume that there's one way to do things. We believe that there's going to be different forms of governance for different types of use cases. And ultimately, we see a world where organizations get involved in their blockchain technology. They spin up their own blockchains in a lot of cases and define their own governance working backwards from the specific objectives of their organization. You said you had a complicated relationship with the word uh, decentralized. I think, from my perspective, I don't like the term disrupt. It's overused. Everybody, you know, two guys trying to, we're trying to disrupt the underwear industry. You know, every radio commercial, right? We found a better way to comb your hair. So we started, so now we're worth a billion. Um, you know, the car disrupted the horse. I mean, everything is always just dis being disrupted Absolutely. or displaced. That's the history of humanity. But if you had to say that there would be a technology or sort of an industry that is being altered <laughs> by you and by blockchain? Is it the database business? What, what is it? Well, yes, you Who should be scared? Okay. Besides so, me for asking questions on things I know very little about. That's a, <laughs> that's a complicated answer, and I don't want to give an answer that's too oversimplified, but blockchain is just an alternative database 
in terms of you know, who should be scared. I think everyone that uses database should be constantly looking at what is the function our database serves, what are the inherent traits or value propositions of blockchain, and how can we benefit from those, right? Everyone should be doing that, and everyone should be at that stage now, or I th and I think we'll get there soon. When you talk about who should be scared, I think what you really talk about, what's the low-hanging fruit? What are the first dominoes that fall in this revolution, right? Um, and that's a trickier question. It really comes down to, it's not, it's not as simple as it's this or that. It really comes down to what entrepreneurs emerge in your territory, right, and start to challenge your incumbent model. Um, I think that uh, outside of finance, which uh, blockchain has revolutionary impacts on, and I can speak a lot about that, mm -hmm. um, I think when you get into large technology uh, networks, right, things that rely on their user base to drive the value, pieces of code that are worth nearly a trillion dollars because people choose to use them, I think that those are uh, really need to understand not just the blockchain technology stack, but the social movement behind tokenization, right? And this idea that users should be a, a bigger beneficiary of the output of those platforms, right? Um, and want to be involved in the creation of its success. I do believe in a world where uh, everything becomes, over time, has a tokenized element to it. We all know those. Really, everything. Let me give you an example. When I say everything, I mean broad. I mean, the, the, not everything, but everything could. So if you, if you think of those people that run into a new clothing brand, right, because they, they, they're, it, it's very early stage, it's niche, and then once everyone's moved in, they're off to the next underground activity because their DNA is discovery, right, and evangelism of new products and things that they think are either cool or add value to society. I think that if you start to tokenize that, those types of components, you create fundamentally more competitive business models. What if, in the early stages, the back of your tag had a private key that gave you tokens that allowed you to have some type of beneficial upside, whether through utility or value, you know, security or this or that? Put that aside. But that type of business model allows your, it turns your user base right, into your marketing team, it turns your user base into your beneficiaries. Right? And so if you can start to create those types of models, what we're seeing is things are going from zero to 10 right, in a fraction of the time because the virality of bringing your community in to your growth is just something that's difficult to compete with is this when those only things though, exist. Is this only, though, uh, an industry right now, I mean, right now, and obviously you're trying to change that with EOS, IOS, IO, and everything, that is too expensive for most organizations, especially small and mid-sized ones, to implement? Uh, that's a good question. Most of the expense uh, of, of these initiatives come through the time, complexity, and legal costs of venturing into territory that there isn't clear frameworks around. Um, so if you look at a company like Block One that was doing something innovative um, when we started designing the EOSIO network, you know, we raised uh, enough, you know, we raised the capital to build the product prior to even, you know, building the business model. We went out and we spent 60% of our entire budget on legal fees to figure out exactly how to enter the market in the best ways possible. 60% of your budget was spent on legal fees? Yes, because we had to get you know, legal opinions in every jurisdiction because you're creating lower, like, global networks, right? And you're selling products to people all around the world. Um, and you want to make sure that you're operating in best practices. And w unlike other industries that have very clear frameworks around them, right? you have to really work backwards and do your best job. And, 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 and then after you go to these lawyers and you get legal opinions in every jurisdiction possible, right, and, and, and you have your clear bill of health, you're still held accountable even if they're wrong. So the point is, is that this is just a, a byproduct of emerging industries, but as we continue, and this is happening now, as you continue to flesh out rules and regulations around these industries, how we should interact with tokens. See, one of the things about tokens is that they're just a unit of account. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. So you can't use a one-size-fits-all model to these things. Tokens will be tickets, Digital goods, I come from an industry of selling virtual assets inside of big online video games. So when we built EOS, we used that model. We created a sale and purchase agreement, and we sold a digital good, right? But understanding how 
those types of things uh, interact with different organizations and, and building mature frameworks, which regulators are working hard to do. And, 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 and everyone's at different stages, and there's really good discussion going on, and everyone's operating with the best of intentions. But that's going to make it a lot easier and therefore cheaper for, for companies to move into the space and deploy things knowing that they're doing it the way that, that the government wants you to do it, the regulators want you to do it, and that they're in compliance with various different but it's, jurisdictions. Well, we have the regulator, by the way, Hester Purse over here. And, and I, you guys good, by the way? Everything OK? $24 million <laughs> settlement. You know, no, we don't need to keep you separated, do we? <laughs> Hester, everything OK? No comment. She's the next panel. We'll, we'll get her to comment, hopefully. Um, but isn't this, I think this is such a great sort of, uh, let's spin my chair a little bit. Um, it's, there we go. Hi, everybody. Um, I think it's such a great story because here you are, this young industry, this, you know, trying to just, I don't say disrupt, I almost said it, trying to do all these new things, and yet you still have to do what every business in the world has had to do forever, which is go through these law firms, which is, I have a law degree, I do not practice, but I have a lot of friends who do, and I mean this with respect to them. Uh, they can be slow, they can be plotting. When billable hours are involved, they can be even slower. And you've got to go through these sort of old-fashioned ways in some ways to get to where you want to be. When you sat down with these attorneys, and again, I'm not knocking any attorneys, this is such a new industry, I don't know if even the case law is there. Did they understand what you were talking about? Well, I hope so. Um, <laughs> we spend a they lot of- They understood the bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time educating them on what they're using, what we're using these uh, tokens for, how we're planning to distribute them, the jurisdictions we're including, the methods we're using to uh, contain the, the, the sale into various different jurisdictions, and then they go back and refer to what exists and tries to map out a road that we can use, and then we take their advice and we implement it as such. But this is just the organic process. Yes, it's more expensive in the early days, but there's also opportunity there. So I think that this is just, we're at the tail end. I, mm -hmm. I, I really am optimistic yeah. that, it, you know, as an organization like Block One, for us, it's just more about understanding the rules than it is really but do arguing the rule, about what are, they are. Are there rules? Do the rules exist? They're, well, well they're, they're materializing. And there is more guidance today than there is yesterday, and it continues to evolve. Sometimes there's steps backwards, and sometimes there's steps forward. But as a whole, there is a much better understanding. You know, as we move into our next product voice, right, there's a much better way or much more clear, you know, from all the different guidance that everyone from the SEC to other regulars have put out, we have a better understanding of what we need to do. And mm -hmm. now there's a little bit more open communication with, with regulators. They're starting to get involved in the space. So you can even go to them and say, listen, we want to do this, and then get their feedback uh, uh, prior to, to, to pushing something forth. And that's something that obviously Block One's committed to doing, cool. but, 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 but as other organizations are as well. So you know, as a technology, and speaking for Dan here, is you know, we, can, we can build products around the rules. We just need to know what they are. Because the more clear the rules are, it makes it much easier for us to define the, the product rules requirements. Are, sounds like are being evolved. You're being, in real time, we're watching the creation of multiple industries. Yeah, and, and on a government-by-government government basis, the process of developing the, those rules are different. America is a very consensus-driven uh, uh, government in itself. There isn't any one person controlling everything at the top, right? It's piece by piece, and everyone has a very specific piece they're looking at. And there's good, open, healthy debate amongst them to do it. Now, what other countries, to be quite honest, operate a little differently sometimes. They can just come out, and all of a sudden, boom, these are the rules. It's done, right? Um, because there's a little bit different way of actually building those rules and implementing them. So one of the, you could call it a strength, a weakness, but also a trans, you know, is, is America's a very democratic organization, so sometimes things take a little bit longer. But it's good. That's one of the reasons we're the place to do business, because we have strong contract law. Agreed. Consensus gets built. There, I have a, a guy I know who still goes to Venezuela and does business, literally brings a suitcase of a million dollars in cash to have lunch. That's a true story, because money's worthless. I mean, literally, you just might as well use it as wallpaper. It's, you know, and I think when you talk about governments, one thing about the, the Bitcoin side in particular, maybe not blockchain, but the Bitcoin use has been, what you hear is, man, it's, you know, Bitcoin's great for Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Cuba, where the economies are collapsed, 
Fiat currencies have zero real value, inflation's out of control, but they wouldn't be useful for a stable US dollar. Yeah, um, well, so that's a great, talking about fiat for a moment, I really just don't think that uh, cryptocurrencies are, are, are really infringing or going to compete directly with fiat currencies. I think they compete more with things like gold, um, and I believe that Bitcoin is a new generation gold, to be quite Thank honest. Thank you. When you really get into it, uh, fiat currencies are built for local spending, right? They're built for local payments. They're built for everything. I mean, if we look at you know, uh, any type of investable asset, people always say, one of the criticisms of Bitcoin is, what are you spending it on? Where can I actually use it? Well, that's a great question. Where, where do you spend gold? And even if I give you the opportunity to spend your gold or your Facebook stock or any other asset you use to store value, would you? No. The answer is no, right. Because the law is not built for it. So every time, if I create a, if you have an adjustable asset, whether it's the proposed Libra or it's Bitcoin or it's gold, right? Every time I made a, 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 a payment in the United States, I'd have to do a calculation as to my losses and gains versus the US dollar, and it would be a tax nightmare, right? So what we do is we use fiat currencies for local spending, and we keep we move assets from, our, from our, our, our stores of value to fiat, and then we keep what we need there. I don't believe that, that fiat in, in some countries are better than other. The US enjoys the, 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 um, the, the benefits of, of having a stable dollar that is well recognized, and people do hold it as a store of value. But a lot of other countries have struggled with that. So I think that Bitcoin is more in a competition of, of things like gold. Um, and I think that cryptocurrencies as a whole will start to reinvent business models in, in lots of ways and, and, and be other types of accounting. But I, I just don't see independently issued currencies, non-governmental currencies, really competing with government issued currencies. I, I knew I liked you because <laughs> I, I've been, you know, just from my little perch, I will not call them cryptocurrencies. Now, CNBC, we are cryptocurrencies, our webpage says cryptocurrencies. So I'm not knocking my organization either. But as a former commodities trader years and years ago, it's a, it's, I don't want to say it's a commodity, but it's certainly not a currency. Because if, if it is, it's a very bad currency. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I know I'm trying to swim upstream on that, calling it crypto commodities or just cryptos, because I love your point. I mean, if, if you have a $10,000 car, and, I, and Bitcoin's worth 10,000, I have one Bitcoin, why would I pay you for that in Bitcoin? Tomorrow could be worth 14,000, in which case I'm angry, or it could be worth 5,000, in which case you're angry, because you got rooked. So where do you see the Bitcoin, which is the most talked about side of sort of your architecture business, what's it going to look like in 10 years? I, uh, uh, I love that question. Uh, so obviously- It means it was too easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I obviously am a big believer in Bitcoin. And I think that while uh, I believe in technological solutions like EOSIA, which are more inventally, are environmentally friendly and are cheaper and much faster, Bitcoin has reached a critical mass of awareness, right, and liquidity that is just a bigger value proposition than any incremental technology differentiation. Um, and for its purpose as a store of value, right, it suffices. And so I believe wholeheartedly that Bitcoin has really won that holy grail of store of value because the critical mass around it is just a massive value proposition as a whole. Uh, so I believe very much in Bitcoin. Um, has Bitcoin won the crypto war, if you will? So, I, I, like I said, I, I see them as apples and oranges. So it's just, in terms of, if you, if you say the war of the, the, the gold standard of, of store of value, um, I, I definitely think that Bitcoin, as, as I mentioned, its, it's value proposition of ubiqu ubiquitous awareness and under, underlying liquidity is so great that you can't improve its technology stack to better compete with it for that use case. But I think that, I don't think Bitcoin's even trying. When you get into other types of, of, uh, of use cases, it's going to be other platforms that realize those smart contract benefits and various other types of product-driven tokens. You know, we used to operate around the constraints of currencies mm. to build our business models. Now we're incorporating them into the product design. Right? And so we can actually build things very specific. When you look at something like Voice, what we're doing, we're saying, well, how do we, how do we, how do we give more value and utility back to users. The output of a platform like Facebook is really just visibility. They create a huge amount of, 
of, of user, critical mass users, and then what do they sell? They sell attention, right? Well, what if we gave that attention back to the users themselves through tokens, right? As they engage with content and create it, and like others, we said this token represents attention, and you can move things up the post with that, with that token, right? And so what that does is it starts to lower the take of organizations like Facebook and give it back to the influencers that are really building the value, right? And so that's the kind of thing where you would never be able to build that on the Bitcoin blockchain. It takes something fast, scalable, and cheap, as we talked about earlier. But good, good intentions are often, I'm old enough to remember the, anybody here remember the internet bubble? <laughs> I'm joking, well, I'm, not, I'm not that old. But I, you know, it, to watch it, a lot of great companies, many of whom still exist, by the way, a lot of great companies were hurt by too many companies, a bubble, a, literally a bubble, a frenzy, fraud, you know, companies, and I felt like at one point two years ago, at sort of the peak of the Bitcoin, you know, when seeing me, when we're talking about it, it's probably not cool anymore. I you guess. guys are the one that created the bubble. We are? <laughs> me? <laughs> the, the media in general. Oh, the me the, we're in the sense now that we're at the blame the media part of the panel. <laughs> well, what happened was, and you know, like any market, right? And I'm not, I'm not, you know, but the I've point heard a lot is, worse, Brendan, believe me. It really <laughs> entered, it really entered uh, mainstream media. And what happened was overnight, it was on every news channel every day for 24 hours a day yes, it was. for an entire year. And what that did, if you just, anyone that understands order books, is there was so much new blood and, and interest coming into the ecosystem that the sell market couldn't keep up. So everyone raced to exchanges. I mean, I, there was a, I, I don't remember which media, but there's a, a, a thing on, on social media where they show uh, uh, one of the media outlets saying, here's how to buy Ripple, and it shows the Ripple price at $4. A week later, here's how to sell Ripple, and it was at $1, right? And so it was literally creating these huge public on-ramps to the whole ecosystem in such a short period of time that the sell, the, the sell supply couldn't reach the demand. And what you had was this... But it was a get-rich-quick... I, I felt like I was the only... I needed Sully coin. I mean, everybody had a coin, right? I mean, there were... Dot, it was so many... I don't want to name them because I'm not trying to, yeah. you know, sort of for lack of a better term, crap on anybody. But at the same time, it's like there was a frenzy. Yes, did we probably contribute to it? And because we covered it, yes. But when something's going up $1,000 a day in value, you can't not expect people to sort of get involved. I mean, trust me, I've been here before. Absolutely. 1999, every, literally taxi drivers, you're in a taxi, they recognize me because I was the NASDAQ guy. I was the one talking about these stocks, going up $30 every day. An analyst would come out and you know, upgrade the stock, it would literally rise a hundred dollars a share. Yeah. I mean, and, and it was, and I felt that same thing. And yet this industry especially was more difficult for novices to understand. I think that's a fair comment, right? A hundred percent. And uh, like I said, I don't think anyone's at fault for kind of what happened in terms of all the attention that came at one moment in time. But media was the conduit which created huge amounts of awareness very quickly. And a lot of people rushed in to get to join in the ecosystem. And it was just uh, a, some supply and demand issue, like you have in, with anything in the world. Um, but ultimately, when you look at the internet bubble and then the crash of the internet bubble, what it does is it sows the seeds of innovation, right? And that's exactly what happened last year. So having been in the space for the last five years, you saw a lot of interest in Spike. Mm -hmm. You saw an unfortunate adjustment that was pretty much inevitable because of the amount of awareness that came in. But now you have the remnants of that interest and an understanding of an industry and real adoption happening on the enterprise level. There has never been, and you know, comes real, in, in adoption and in integration of the whole ecosystem like there is today, whether it's yeah. Fidelity starting to incorporate digital assets into their offering yeah. of other people, whether it's the New York Stock Exchange releasing their first cryptocurrencies exchange backed, right? Um, you hear about every organization now with some type of initiative, whether it's public or private, um, that is starting to get into the space. When Coinbase CEO comes out, and he's been tweeting recently that a year ago, it was, will institutions ever be part of this? Now it's three to $500 a month coming in with new institutional dollars to start to buy these digital assets. And that's a response to the demand of their customers. So real adoption is happening today. Uh, and I think that uh, the actual industry as a whole has, is as healthy of a place as I've ever seen it. Is it? Because, you know, everybody here, I'm sure, knows a realtor, right? Like, they either, you know, they, they, maybe they are one themselves. And in the housing markets, when they get hot, realtors in this room will, or people that know realtors will nod their head. You get a lot of people that suddenly decide to become realtors. 
And you know, somebody who's been in the business, my brother-in-law is a realtor in Maryland, he's been in the business 15, 20 years. He's a long, that's his job for life, he, and he enjoys it. And then all these people come in that are new and they try to you know, get a piece of the action. And it just kind of causes disruption and then the housing market inevitably turns down. And then you figure out who the real players are. The ones like my brother-in-law who stick it out through the good times and sort of the, and the tougher times. Where are we in that cycle now from an industry? Because IDC says that the blockchain industry is going to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 75% a year for the next five years. IDC is a great company, and I respect their work immensely, but that's a big number. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a conservative estimate. By, I mean, obviously, you're speaking to a very biased party here. But I, uh, when, the deeper, one of the things that's so, I, I, I tweeted once, I said, people get into Bitcoin because they understand one element of its value proposition. And they stay in Bitcoin because they understand the depth of, of what it actually is. And when you really get into blockchain technology, at first you understand, oh, it's a secure database. And then you're like, well, oh, this is a, a transparent and auditable and immutable ledger. Right? Well, what's the implications of that? That means that now we can have a degree of trust in these databases that we never could in the past. And you can start to really create new business models which align yourself, the organization, with your audience. One of the things that we looked at with Voice is we said, we don't want to just use tokenization. We want to create alignment between the company and our user base. Right? And by, by, by uh, spreading the attention that social networks create with our users, and then us taking a portion of that as well, and being completely transparent throughout the whole tech stack, so everyone can see every algorithm that we use, right, and how it actually, how things appear in their feed, and who's paying for it. What it does is, it says, guess what? Here's our revenue stream, it's transparent, it's aligned with yours, right, and ultimately, uh, what we're really doing is creating uh, aligned business models where we're not incentivized to extract as much information as possible and then dismember it and sell it off at an ever-growing pace that just continues to pull these things. We get in the same horse together and we say, guess what? We're not going to try to be a trillion-dollar company, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to try to be a much smaller one, but you're going to have transparency on how we monetize our, our take, right, and how we use your data. And when, when your data is value, you're the one that's reaping the rewards, not an organization that's just constantly that, okay. incentivized to extract. Now, there's people in here that are sort of like the, you know, the Jekyll Island Fed folks, and, and I, you know, that, that'll disagree fundamentally with the statement that I'm going to say, but money is finite, okay, theoretically. Okay, I get people, well, they can print as much as, yes, I understand that. But generally, when an industry grows, it's because another industry is shrinking. The money is transferred. You, I, you buy my house, we, we transfer the asset. What assets are going to be transferred? What is, where's the money, the new money, the 75% growth rate that you think is conservative, where's that growth, the capital, coming from? Um, well, I think that uh, you, you have to, if you apply that same question to the internet, it's a very complicated answer. I think at the, at the, at the stage we're at now, and probably the stuff that they're referring to is, we're in the R&D stage, so right now, organizations have realized that there's an alternative way to do things, and they need to start outlaying capital to enterprise groups like IBM and various people providing solutions to put your organization or to incorporate blockchain into your technology stack. And I think that that industry is going to be explosive. I think 75% is conservative in terms of you looking at the real dollars at the bottom line of organizations outlaying capital expenditure just to future-proof their organization going forward. So yeah. I think that we're very much in the era of understanding Right? And that represents all the research and development that's going to go into understanding what they can do with these types of technologies. And then when you get into the actual application right, of the technologies through various business models, you're going to see them specifically eat out of, uh, of the current market share of their verticals. Because this, this is probably a, a, a question for Commissioner Peirce, and, and I'm sure I'll ask her the same. Companies would love to tell you as little as possible about their business as they can get away with. Is that a fair statement? Nodding her head, good, got one right. And you're talking about blockchain as being this, you hear the word transparency all the time. Companies don't like transparency. Yeah, and one of the great things about blockchain is you can really customize what you show. I think that the transparency is not going to come from a, an organization waking up every day and say, hey, let's show them everything we do all day. It's gonna come from other emergent competitors that are willing to show more of their technology stack, and then the adoption that's stimulated from that type of behavior. As we move 
in that direction, it's gonna become a part of best practices to behave that way and to show more. I mean, this whole world is moving to an ever, ever more transparent world, right? And I always say, um, you know, there's no one that can leverage blockchain the way that governments can, because I always, blockchain is just regulation for data. But aren't they scared of it? Uh, I think that the, I, I, I believe wholeheartedly that, that the, the initial fear of any, everyone is scared of something they don't fully understand uh, on the onset. But I do think that there's a growing amount of awareness within our institutions and governments about what this technology is and what it can do. It wasn't just, I think, two weeks that China came out and on you know, their evening news and said, this is great technology, we need to adopt it as a whole. One of the things I wanna- Which uh, I found odd. And listen, I know you live in Hong Kong and I've been there with the protests and there's a lot going on. You have to be careful what you say. As your attorney, I advise you to watch out. Um, I found that a little disingenuous by Xi Jinping, the Chinese premier, as a country that tries in some ways to not control its currency, but by pegging it to the dollar in a range, they are artificially sort of controlling where their currency trades, frustrating a lot of free traders. I think when Is, you- Would China be a good partner? I think when you isolate it on contra contradictions or hypocrisy, the reality is, as all governments have a whole host of those types of things throughout there. So I, I think you really need to get into the specifics of um, what the initiatives are. Um, and I don't, as we stay out of you know different forms of blockchain governance, I stay out of different forms of traditional governance as well. Um, but ultimately, living in Hong Kong, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, but ultimately, going back to the point of governments being able to leverage blockchain unlike anyone else. The real opportunity, in my opinion, from a government's perspective, is to put their national currencies on the blockchain. And I think you're going to see that happen very imminently with some of the biggest nations on the planet. And what that really does, right, is it totally opens up the currency, right, for business, for, for next level business adoption. Once you put your currency on a blockchain, right, you've actually turned your currency into a development platform. Right? When people can take the US dollar and start incorporating it into their products directly into their tech stack, guess what? You'd see whole hosts of, of, of various types of, of projects adopting right, the US dollar blockchain because they would be able to do things that right now they need to use an alternative, less optimal option to accomplish it because the US dollar just can't integrate with their technology stacks. Right now, I have to, to wire money out through a bank through expensive or integrate with Square or something, and it's, there's great limitations on what I can do with it. On the flip side, governments would never be able to control their money supply, right? But that's Combat. all they want to do, but that's their main job. But I mean, no, they would never be able to control it, um, it, it better, is what I'm getting at. So okay. they would never be able to, uh, they could use blockchain to have better control, transparency, they could automate AML, KYC. A blockchain dollar, I can trace back to every single owner that's ever, that's ever been there. I can see its entire course. Right now we live in a financial system where things can go off grid and then they can come back on grid. And all of our combat and effort goes into, well when it's off our grid system, what's happening to it, right? Were people using it for illicit purposes? Where did you get that money? It can't get back into the banking system. We have to put these huge manual processes in place to make sure that people aren't involved in illicit activity. When you put everything on the blockchain, you get an unprecedented degree of transparency. Things like tax law could be coded into the dollar itself, right? Can you imagine programming, right, the entire, uh, the entire tax law? It would mean that not only would the US or any other organization have better control over their money supply, more transparency, less fraud, right? Um, but it would give more clear rules to the users on how to actually use it properly. So the opportunity, and this will happen. It, it, I'm not saying which country. So. I know so, I'm not, I'm not saying which country will happen first, I'm not saying they will all there, but there are several organ countries, right, that are already moving very much in this direction at a very quick speed, and the first groups to do so, right, are gonna get the benefit of all the developers building with blockchain technology, integrating with their currencies, because now the functionality they want, their currency supports. And so this is one of the biggest opportunities, in my opinion, in terms of governments and how they interact with blockchain. So we, 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 we initially thought about audience Q&A, but Brendan I think, adjusted his schedule for us this morning, so we're gonna blast. We had some pre-submitted questions. You can see the very fancy way that I've, uh, are you ready? Here we go, let's see if I can read this. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up here and get ready for Commissioner Purse. What do you think you'll be remembered for in 20 years? Oh goodness. You're 33 years old, you're from Iowa. 
Um, well, my hope is that uh, what we as an organization are remembered for um, is having expanded the use case of blockchain technology and been good custodians for its development. Um, we are an organization that doesn't, uh, you know, when this, when this industry first emerged, there was a lot of, uh, just the same way the internet, it was a lot of more radical free thinkers that represented the industry as a whole. But as you move into systemic adoption, you generally get a much more balanced view. And I'm a very, I'm more in that boat. Um, I believe that part of our job, in addition to creating the technology itself, is finding that healthy middle ground that meets the constraints mm -hmm. of all parties involved. And that's regulators, that's governance, governments, that's big business, and that's entrepreneurs, right? And so it's that intersection at which is so important and where the real value proposition is. So we spend a lot of time, right? Not just on the technological side of blockchain, but on the legal side of blockchain and working backwards from how we believe this is going to develop. And we try to position our organization at that intersection yeah. so we can be a healthy conduit for its, for its growth. Well, according to past press, you've said Bitcoin has scaling issues, doesn't EOS IO? Yeah. Uh, oh. Oh, that's a great question. So ESIO is an open source protocol, and when you look at one blockchain in particular, when you spin it up, yes, it has scaling limitations the same way a computer has single-threaded throughput limitations. The next step, and ESIO was built to be fundamentally asynchronous in nature, meaning that you can start to put out multiple blockchains and schedule actions across all of them and still get a deterministic output, meaning you can really horizontally scale. Now, these are huge undertakings, and our organization is trying to move there as quickly as possible. But you don't start going parallel until you've really maximized the single-threaded throughput of a machine. And so that has been our initiative so far, is make one single chain as fast as it possibly can be, right, um, and as efficient as it can possibly be. We have been actively working on, for the last, for over a year now, how you then make that parallel, how you really start to expand you know, uh, on, a, on a near infinite basis for organizations to meet the needs of millions and millions of users. And that's something we continue to invest heavily in and work on, and that is still the goal that we see for EOS IO. When you get into specific types of scaling limitations, absolutely, we're still at a very early stage of this type of development, um, but I still think that Block One is light years ahead of any other organization in terms of this type of innovation. The final question I'll ask is this. I, I just finished a book driving, listening to it, called Super Pumped, about, by Mike Isaac, about the building of Uber. Fantastic. It's a good name. It, it is, because Travis Kalanick was like, we're super pumped. And it was a terrific book, well worth a read. The best business book, by the way, I've read in the last 10 years, also about building a business, is Shoe Dog, Phil Knight, founder of Nike. If you haven't read it, go buy it, buy it for Christmas. It uh, talks about building companies. And I wish nothing but success for, for Block One and you and Dan, and especially being sort of part of the Virginia Tech community here. You're 33, you're, and if you do get that success building a company, you know, Kalanick, he wanted to just build this car sharing app. He didn't want to run an HR division. He didn't want to have, hear employee complaints. He didn't want to talk about maternity and paternity leave. You know, he just was, and that was the downfall. That was, that was his downfall. When you build a business, you're going to have to deal with a lot of stuff you don't want to deal with. I mean, you know, um, what are you most service about as a 33-year-old CEO you obviously know the technology, but what do you think are the challenges of just being a, a, maybe the, the leader of what could become a, a large organization? Mm. Well, there's a lot of challenges, of course, um, uh, and they're not the challenges that you'd expect when you start an organization. Um, uh, and, and, and there is no broad theme to those challenges, but if you look at everything from, you know, one of the things I, you know, I always deal with on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis is meeting the expectations of the community. Um, it's really important to us. We, we build community-driven business models, but there is a sense of no matter what you do, you're never going to satisfy everyone, right? And we try to move very quickly as an organization. So on one hand, when, um, uh, but the expectations to, you know, release a huge blockchain project, well, what's next, what's next, what's next? We're in this thing where, you know, if, if, we, kind of, if we kind of keep our, our cards close to our chest and we're, we're building things under the cover, everyone's like, well, you're, you're too quiet, you're too quiet, you're too quiet, tell us what you're doing, right? And then we kind of uh, uh, do an um, you know, announcement or, or, or share what our next project is, 
And then it's like, well, why'd you tell us if it's not ready, right? And you know, if you get into the industry I came from in, in video games and stuff, I mean, we know about a video game that's in development five years before it actually comes to fruition with no release dates or anything. Um, and so we try to try strike a balance. We don't announce something before we, you know, uh, before we've even conceived it or started huge headway into it. But we also sit, when you go back to things like the legal that we deal with and, 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 and integrating it healthily into society, there's timelines that are outside of our control as well. So we try to strike that balance. It'll never make anyone fully happy and satisfied with the way we're doing things, but that's a big, a big challenge. Um, the other challenge is just reaching our full potential. I wholeheartedly believe that um, um, uh, block one and the talent that we have is as world-class as I've ever seen. Uh, and I've been a part of small organizations and I've been a part and I've been involved in large organizations. And I stand by that statement wholeheartedly. And so as a custodian of that group of people, um, it's so important to me that I paved the path so that we can reach our full potential and I hold myself very accountable for that. Well, I'm super pumped to have had the chance to speak with you, Brendan Bloomer. Me too. I've learned a lot, and I know we're going to, we're gonna, I want to say a big round of applause for Brendan Bloomer, Block One, please. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. No, thank you.